Good morning. Good to see each of you. And uh, it's good to be back home. Uh, some of you maybe didn't know we were gone. But uh, Karen and I have been in Egypt for just under three weeks. And this was uh, something that uh, we always wanted to do. It was, she had a big birthday this year. And uh, we discovered some friends were going to be meeting together, a, a number of Adventists, to go scuba diving in the Red Sea. And Karen and I scuba dive, and so we went and, and went to Egypt. She always wanted to see the pyramids, and so we took a pure vacation and just had a great time. Uh, and I, I mention all that to explain why I don't have my mustache. Because when you scuba dive, your mask can leak. And so this makes for a better seal. So I'm just trying it out for a while. We'll see what happens. But it is good to be back home. Yeah, it grows back in about a week <laughs> if I wanted to. We, we are talking about a serious subject today. And um, it's going to be based on Revelation chapter 3. Uh, those of you who have been uh, following along, you know we've had a special week of prayer with our AFCO students here in the chapel this week talking about the message to Laodicea. And uh, we're going to be focusing on that today. And no way in the world that I can uh, do the subject justice in the time that we have, but I'm going to do my best uh, because it's a very important message. And um, <clears throat> might begin by just inviting you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and it begins with verse 14. While you're turning, I should probably give you a little explanation. The book of Revelation is really divided up into three big visions where you've got the seven churches, you've got the seven seals, you've got the seven trumpets. And very simplistically, the seven churches would represent the spiritual history of the church from the first coming to the second coming. The seven seals, you know, begins with the four horsemen of the apocalypse, that sort of covers the history of the church politically from the first coming to the second coming. The seven trumpets, that series of visions, covers the history of the church from a military perspective from the first coming to the second coming. So when you look at the seven messages to the seven churches, not only were they literal messages for those seven churches in Asia, but it's much bigger than that. It's giving special messages to the different ages or epochs of the church that it would go through between the time of Christ, starting with Ephesus, and it ends with Laodicea. So when we read the message to the church of Laodicea, it's talking about the last age of the church. That's us. Uh, how many of you believe we're living in the last age of the church? And when you read what it says, it is a pretty fitting description. So let's read that together. Go to Revelation chapter 3. It begins with verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, now, there was a place called Laodicea there in Asia Minor, and it was close to um, you know, Ephesus and Smyrna and Philadelphia and Pergamos and Thyatira and uh, the other churches. So uh, there's this little circle of churches there. But remember, this is a much bigger uh, picture here, meaning. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus was the first thing God created. It means that he was there at the beginning because all things that were made were made by him. He is the fountain for the creation of God. Some people have misunderstood that verse. I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, cold does not mean lost, and hot means saved. Jesus would never say, I could wish you were lost. Cold means you're in a position of repentance, of sorrow for sin. You're turning to God. He can reach you there. Hot would mean you're full of fervor and zeal, working for God. But to be in the middle, to be lukewarm, is what the concern of this passage is. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are neither warm nor cold, neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I have become rich and wealthy and am in need of nothing, 
and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you might be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, if I, as I have also overcome and have sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is the message to the church of Laodicea. And it's describing a people who are lost in church. Now, there are five high points that I want to talk about that you find in this message. And it's dealing with they're having the wrong value, the wrong worth, the wrong works, the wrong witness, the wrong wealth, the wrong way, and the wrong wardrobe. And we'll go through those highlight them, and then we're going to talk about the message that Jesus gives that is the solution to this condition. Now, the word Laodicea, it basically means the justice of the people or the judging of the people. This last age of the church, many believe, began back in 1844. It wouldn't surprise us. It would mean a time of judgment. The justice or the judging of the people. Well, they have the wrong worth. They don't know what their status is before God. What's one of the last things Jesus said as they were crucifying him? Father, forgive them because they don't know. His own people did not know that they crucified their Savior, their Redeemer. Things haven't changed. God's people often don't know what's going on. We, we don't see ourselves through his eyes. Paul gives us some advice. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. He says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Paul is saying, we need to know. We need to examine. We need to test. How do you do that? Well, Jesus said, you'll know them by what? By their works. And you can also know by the fruits. So we need to be looking at our lives and saying, am I fully surrendered? Do I know the Lord? What's the first thing Jesus says to the church of Laodicea? He said, I know your works. By the way, Revelation says he's coming to reward every man according to his works. We are saved by grace, but your works show whether or not you're saved. So it's one thing to say, Lord, Lord. But as it said in our scripture reading, there's going to be a lot of people in the last days saying, Lord, Lord, and they think they're saved and they're not but they're busy working for the Lord. They're in church. But he says, depart from me, you who work iniquity. Their works are lawless. But somehow they're deluded into thinking they're saved when they're not. Think about when David had Nathan come to him. After David has killed Uriah and committed adultery with Bathsheba and tried to cover it, cover it all up, David was so quick to condemn someone else. And then Nathan said, you're the man. He didn't know. He had somehow become self-deluded. Or you've got the Pharisee who goes into the temple to pray and he says, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like other men. I fast and I pay tithe and I'm not like this publican back here. And he is in church. But Jesus says he goes home unjustified. He's lost in church. That makes me shudder when I ask myself, Lord, is it I? You remember Jesus said to the disciples, you're going to betray me. And Peter said, not me. No, they might, not me. Jesus said, you're going to be the worst of all. You'll do it with swearing and cursing. That's why it's good for us to say, Lord, is it I? Now, let me make it clear. As I talk about the message to Laodicea, it's a, it's a message of, uh, of rebuke and conviction and salvation and love. I know that you know, there are different stages and different degrees of commitment in every church. And 
if we were going to compare ourselves among ourselves and by ourselves, we got a great church. But that's the danger. We get to think that we're saved based on our horizontal comparisons. Those that do those things are not wise. We must compare ourselves to Jesus. And if we compare ourselves to Jesus, we might find that we're poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. You know that uh, the church is always about 40% better than the world when it comes to morality. But just because you're 40% better than the world doesn't mean that you're not 80% less than Jesus. And so we've got to be careful to have the right gauge when we say, Lord, where am I? In Romans 9, 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel, Though the number of the sons of Israel be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. That's a, a concerning thought. The Spirit of Prophecy says there might be one in 20 that really knows what it is to have an experimental religion where you're really walking with the Lord. We need that experience. I want that, don't you, friends? What's, what are the consequences if we don't have that? If we do not repent and get hot or cold, if we stay lukewarm, it says he will spew us out of his mouth. I came back this week from uh, Egypt and uh, we cleaned out our refrigerator before we left to make sure, you know, you're gone three weeks, nothing goes bad. But I left the almond milk because I've never had almond milk go bad. I usually drink it too fast. And I thought, well, this stuff, you know, it probably you could pull it out of the pyramids, it'd be good. <laughs> I got back from Egypt, and I enjoyed the Egyptian food, but I really wanted a bowl of cereal. The night I got back, and I couldn't wait, and I got the cereal, I poured a bowl of cereal, reached in, I poured my almond milk. There's only about that much left in there, but I thought that's enough for a bowl. And I found out what can happen after three weeks to almond milk. It had never gone that long before. And I took my first bite. And I went, oh, this ain't cool. <laughs> Something's wrong. I feel like I just filled my mouth with some dirty gym socks. And I started looking for the sink. I thought, I'd have to be stupid to swallow this. <laughs> I went running for the sink and I spewed it out of my mouth. And then what really made me sad is I just wrecked a perfectly good bowl of cereal because it was all saturated with that stuff. I won't make that mistake twice. So Jesus said that if we're lukewarm, it can't be tolerated. We will be rejected. Serious consequences. We need to know what our worth is before God. Amen? Amen. And then you've got the wrong works. He says, I know your works. Now, I'm going to be going through the five points that Jesus mentioned here. He talked about wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And um, the wrong works. What does that mean, wretched? Well, you only find that word a couple of times in the New Testament. One of them is where Paul is describing his condition before he found Jesus and he was set free and born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, even though he knew what was right, he's in church. He can't seem to do what's right. And the thing he wants to do, he doesn't do. And the thing he doesn't want to do, he does it. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. I'm under condemnation. I'm under judgment. Who will deliver me from this? And then you go to the next verses in chapter 8. It says, praise God, through Jesus Christ, he saved me so I no longer have to walk after the Spirit. But I walk after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. He saved him, set him free. So this wretchedness is this condition of lostness, knowing what's right, but not doing what's right. What did Jesus say to those that think they're saved? He says, do not say unto me, Lord, Lord, if you do not the will of my Father in heaven. How do you describe the foolish man? The foolish man is one who hears these words and does not do them. And so, these people who think they're saved, they're in a wretched condition. They're under judgment. Romans 7, 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? They're captive to, to sin and they're condemned. But in church, 
God wants us to be, what does it say all the, over and over, seven times in Revelation? To him that overcomes. To him that overcomes. Can you be an overcomer? Yes. You know, I believe it, friends. I'm just old-fashioned, and I still believe Jesus can save us from sin. Yes. Because when I came to Christ, as you've heard me say, I was drinking and smoking and stealing and lying and cursing, and, and he saved me from those things. I started doing things differently. And if you're a Christian, you should do things differently. You should be doing the will of God. It's not the hearers of the word, but the what? The doers. Now, we're not saved by our works, but if we're saved, the works are different. Amen? Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And you need the Holy Spirit in this present age to do it, friends. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship. Everybody quotes the verses prior. We are saved by grace through faith. But you've got to keep reading. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Colossians 3, verse 5. Therefore, put to death your members that are on the earth. Put to death in your members that are on the earth fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you were in them. But now you yourselves are, have put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. There's a change. Christians are not just forgiven. Old things are passed away. All things are made new. One of the conditions of the church of Laodicea is we want to be saved with our sin. And we can get comfortable because we go to church, we sing, we give. And we think, I'm a member, I'm a Christian, but are we holy? Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. It's a call to holiness, is that message to the Laodicean church. You also notice it says they're miserable. They're the wrong kind of witness. How does Jesus introduce himself to the church of Laodicea? The true and faithful witness. We're called to bear witness. And if we're miserable, what kind of witness is that? The gospel is good news. Amen? And we ought to be witnessing for the Lord. There ought to, ought to be a devotion. Are we reading the word every day? Are we spending time in prayer? Regular. While we were in Egypt, uh, we stopped first for a couple of days in Cairo and, and Karen got to see the pyramids. I'd been there 40 years ago. I'd seen them. But saw the pyramids and some of the sites there and we were at a hotel that from our vantage point we could look out onto the roof of some other buildings around us and I saw this one home across the street and you could see in the windows it's hot there so all the windows are open it's full of people and they have the call to prayer in Muslim countries and I saw this one man came up on the roof I see the house is full of people but one man came out of the roof and he had a sink up there and he washed himself and nobody was watching, he thought. Rolled out his little rug, got down, went through his gesticulations of prayer as the Muslims do. And, you know, I, I watched that and I had to admire not his doctrine but his devotion. And he was not afraid to get up on the roof and pray. The Bible says in the last days we need to let our light shine. People need to know what we believe. Daniel chapter 6, we've just been studying this. He went up on the roof and he knelt, opened the windows, and he knelt and prayed three times a day. Psalm 55, 17, Daniel probably read this, evening, morning, and at noon I will pray and cry aloud and he will hear my voice. You might be going to church and giving your offerings and tithe and singing the songs and helping in different ministries. Do you have a devotional life? Do you know Jesus? Do you spend regular time with him? It's possible for us to go through all the outward things and not really know the Lord. And are you witnessing? Are you telling others about your faith? You know, if you walk out the doors of this church across the parking lot, you've got uh, an office and a warehouse with one of the most 
connected Seventh-day Adventist witnessing ministries, if you say, I don't have any witnessing material, well, shame on you. Because we got a warehouse right over there. I hope you've got some stuff in your car. Amen? I hope that you are trying to share your faith, speaking the word for Jesus. Daniel 12, 3, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. God wants us to be witnesses, turning others to righteousness. Proverbs eleven thirty, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. You know, after David repents in Psalm 51, he says, then sinners will be converted unto you. If we've turned from our sins, we're going to want to tell the good news to others. Otherwise, the Laodicean church ends up being like that rich man clothed in purple who feasts every day while the beggar lies at our gates starving for the crumbs that fall from our table. You've got the bread of life. And if we're just getting together and feasting on it in occasions like this, and we forget about all the people out there that are starving for Jesus, you'll find out that in the judgment... The poor man's in Abraham's bosom. He's in heaven, and the rich man is in Hades. It's not enough to just know the truth and feast on the truth. We've got to share it. I was hungry, and you fed me, Jesus said. We've got to be careful that we don't get into a comfortable, lukewarm religion. Not only the wrong witness, they get the wrong wealth. They think they're rich, and Jesus says they're poor. We need that poverty of spirit. Isaiah 55, 2. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your wages for that which does not satisfy? You know, I was reading this week that um, when you consider there are 8 billion people in the world today, some of you might think I'm really struggling financially here in North America and I'm having a hard time and they got so many billionaires I read about and I'm not very rich. Oh, yes, you are. The average American makes between fifty-six and fifty-four thousand dollars a year. The average American, many make more. And then, if you've got a combined household, that's over a hundred thousand. That puts you in the top ninety-seven percent of the world. When it comes to possessions and wealth, people are not fighting to get into Afghanistan and get citizenship. Where does everybody want to go? Yeah, I mean, even if you take this just on a level of, you know, God's got a very powerful church in North America. We support most of the missions around the world. But the condition spiritually of the people is materialism is just rife, you know. We're, we've got all kinds of stuff. How many of you know, folks, you drive through the neighborhood and they got a three-car garage, but the cars are all on the outside? Because the garages are full of stuff. How many of you are in that category? No, you don't have to raise your hands, right? Rich and increased with goods. I mean, even if you just take it on a physical level. And the 3% that have more than us, that's your millionaires and your billionaires that uh, we read about and sometimes envy. But we are in the top 97% of the people on the planet. And many are still not happy and satisfied that they have enough. Rich and we think we're rich and increased with good. James 2.5 says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised that those, to those that love him? What did Jesus say about the danger of earthly riches? He looked around and he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Because we can come to the place where we trust in earthly riches. We become satisfied. This is what God said through Moses to the children of Israel as they were coming into the promised land. He said, beware. He says, you're going to go into cities that have walls you didn't build and houses you didn't build and vineyards you did not plant and orchards you did not plant and wells you did not dig. Beware that when you eat and you drink and you're satisfied that you don't forget about the Lord who gave you all these things. Wealth can be a stumbling block. It can be dangerous. 
They think they're rich. He says they're really poor. We also see that um, they got the wrong way. They're going the wrong way because they're blind. I remember um, I was driving from, at least the plan was, to drive from California to Texas a number of years ago, late at night. And I pulled over at one point to uh, get some gas and a bite to eat and, and got back on the road again and felt much refreshed. And I was going down the road making excellent time. And as I was going through New Mexico, I was amazed how many Whataburgers, Whataburger, any of you know what Whataburger is? It's, uh, it's another hamburger chain. Some people in California have never heard of Royal Castle or some of the others you have back east. What a burger. And I thought, they got two of them just in a few miles. That's strange. I kept driving and, and then I, I saw something else. And I, thought, I thought I saw a tire store just like that a few miles back. I'd gotten turned around on the clover leaf somehow. I don't have the best sense of directions. And I was back going to California. And I had been going 10 miles, happy, whistling, singing to myself in the car. I was in the right car, had the right temperature. Everything felt great. But I was never going to get to Texas. And finally, I saw, you know, the interstate signs? Instead of saying Interstate 40 East, it said Interstate 40 West. And I thought, I'm almost sure Texas is east. <laughs> and then I had to drive like another six miles to find a place to turn around. It didn't matter how sincere I was. I was going the wrong way and I didn't know and I was very comfortable in the process. You can be comfortably lost. That's the danger of Laodicea. We're going the wrong way because we're blind and we don't know it. John 9, 39, For judgment I have come into the world, Jesus said, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. Isaiah 30, verse 21, says, You'll hear a word behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand or you turn to the left, we need to be listening for the Holy Spirit and being in the right way. Otherwise, we could be lost and blind. I love the story of Bartimaeus. This blind man, he has nothing. And Jesus opens his eyes and he throws aside his rags and says he follows Jesus rejoicing. He is a poor blind man who can now see. He has nothing, but he is happy because his eyes are open and he follows Jesus. And then you notice they've got the wrong wardrobe. He says, you're naked. And they don't know it. Now, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of being around people and suddenly realizing you're naked. I have. <laughs> I won't go into detail. Some of you have heard the story. But I was living up in the cave and I used to never wear clothes. I was a hippie. I was by myself most of the time. Every now and then I'd meet other hikers, but most of them were naked too back then. That was a, some of you remember the 70s. It, it was different. But uh, we were trying to be at one with God, and we said Adam and Eve were naked. I really, I was using the Bible. And um, so, I, you, you know, at first, when you're not wearing clothes, you're raised to understand something's missing. But you can get to the place where you don't think about it. And I honestly had got to that place. You know, you live for weeks and months. You don't have clothes on unless you go to town. I usually kept my clothes in a backpack. And whenever I hiked down to town, there actually had a big rock. It was called the Jesus Rock. That's really what it was, because someone had painted Jesus on it. And I would stop there, how appropriate, and I'd put on my clothes. And I'd go to town. This particular morning, I, um, I was taking a different road to town, different trail, because I didn't need to go to the market to panhandle. I already had some money. So I was going right to Thrifty to get three scoops of ice cream, because it was a desert and it was hot. And I was in such a hurry that I was very focused. And I started going off, and I was inside Palm Springs city limits, and the first group of buildings there, there were some homes, and there was a Catholic church. And um, I'm walking through these desert trails. It's beautiful. There's a lot of, it was springtime. The cactus were blooming, the desert flowers everywhere, and it was just a wonderful, felt great. 
And a Spanish family, husband, wife, and two girls, decided to go for a nature walk after church. And they were going up these desert trails. And I came around the bush, and I finally saw them, made eye contact, and, and just a, a shock instantly went through the family. And it was, you know, just visceral. I could just see there, just they stopped, and the, the woman closed her eyes, and two little girls, they closed their eyes, they turned away, and it was just like, all happened very quickly, and the father kind of grabbed them, and, and I thought there was something behind me that had scared them. And I, <laughs> I thought, what is it? We'll run together. <laughs> and this all happened in a fraction of a second. And then I realized, I forgot to put my clothes on. And, you know, I tell this story and people laugh. And I'll tell you, friends, it was not funny. I think those poor girls are in therapy still. <laughs> Just, and I, I was so embarrassed. I felt great before. And then I saw myself through their eyes. I felt utterly naked. And I ran slinking behind the next obstruction that I put on my clothes that were in my backpack. So what do you do if God says you're naked? Wouldn't that give you shame? Who, we can't be naked in the presence of God. You know, at great risk, I want to pause right here and say something. When it says you don't know that you're poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked, it means you're unashamed. He says, I'm offering you clothes that the shame of your nakedness might be covered. Now, maybe it's just me. Um, you know, I live pretty far out in the world, but I think that we might be losing a sense of propriety in the house of God with what we wear. And... I know some sisters are probably going to be a little upset with me, but you realize that uh, men can be distracted by a woman's figure. And when you come into the house of God, I think we ought to take special care to make sure that we have enough material where it's long enough and high enough and loose enough to cover business. And while I'm on the subject, since this could be my last sermon. <laughs> Paul says in 1 Timothy 2, verse 9, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but that which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now, while I, Karen and I were in um, Egypt, we stayed at this hotel. And um, when we got our keys and we're going to a room, we had to walk by the pool. And I saw something I don't think I'll ever forget. There were two families at opposite ends of the pool. There was a family from, I think, Italy based on the accident. There were a couple of men and a couple of women. And then there was a family looked like they were from Arabia with one man and three women. Karen was sure that they were all his wives. That's not, I don't want to go there. That's, that has nothing to do with what I'm going to say. The women were wearing burqa bathing suits. And they were splashing around in the water, covered from head to toe, and this, like that, say, yeah. Like that. Having a great old time. A couple of kids there, too. And I tried not to stare, but I thought, you're going to drown swimming in that. But... You know, then I look back at the Italian gang, and I've just got to tell you, walking by that group, that a 10-year-old boy would probably have a doctorate in female anatomy if he saw that. There was nothing left of the imagination. And I, again, I'm just sharing with you, I, I looked on Amazon. Put that, that picture up there. This is an exact quote. I didn't doctor it on Amazon. I, I searched it last night, and I thought, do they sell those bathing suits? And it said, women, Muslim, burkini. That's a burkini. Swimsuit. Modest swimwear, Islamic. And so out of curiosity, I typed in modest Christian swimwear. Nothing came up. 
Now, I'm not suggesting, please, Pastor Doug, you telling us that the girls got to wear these burkinis from now? No, no, don't misunderstand. But if you were standing there by the pool that day and you said, which one is modest? It wouldn't take long to figure it out. And I just wonder if we're measuring ourselves by the world and we're, just, we're falling for the fashions of the world and we forget that when we come to the holy house of God on a holy day to worship a holy God and the angels in heaven cover their faces and they cover their feet and they say, holy, 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 if maybe we're just losing the concept of holiness and modesty. And God says to the church in Laodicea, you don't know that you're naked. And it's not just the women. Sometimes the men, they come to church looking like they just left the gym. Now, if you are poor and you don't have clothes, bless your heart, come. Let us know, we'll help you. But let's not use that as an excuse to forget that we worship a holy God. Joshua, the high priest before the Lord, the angel of the devil was accusing him. Uh, before the angel of the Lord, the devil was accusing him because his garments were filthy. And the priest had to have, he represented the people. He came to intercede before the people. He had to have clean garments. Christians ought to be witnessing also by what we wear and not compromising with every fashion in the world. Amen? Amen. Revelation chapter 7. And I said to him, who are these arrayed in white robes? And he said, sir, you know. He said, these are those who have come out of great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. God wants us to have those robes that are made white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? So when Jesus describes the condition of the Laodicean church, poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked, and he said, they don't know. They don't know what they're standing is. Then he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. He's saying, I love you. I'm telling you these things because I don't want to lose you. But you've got to wake up. You need to be revived. He says, you need to repent. Be zealous. That means be enthusiastic. Be serious about your repentance. And let the works be different. There needs to be a conversion because you love the Lord. Because he says, I love you. And then he counsels us. I think we should listen to Jesus' counsel, don't you? He says, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. He mentions three things. Gold, white raiment, and eye balm or eye salve. The gold, that means we live by the word. Psalm 19, verse 8, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord are pure, enlightening the eyes, more to be desired than gold, than much fine gold. That's the refined gold that Jesus is talking about. Look at Psalm 119, 127. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Proverbs 8, 9. My fruit is better than gold, yes, than fine gold. It means living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It's talking about a love that lives the law. A love that lives out the word of God in our lives. And he says, buy of me gold. How do you buy the gold? Well, the same way in Isaiah, it says, buy without money, without price. He's paid for it. We need to just turn in our receipt of faith. It says, in the white garments, Revelation 7, it's that, those garments that are washed and made white in the blood of the Lamb. Look at Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. That robe is the robe of Christ's righteousness. You know, the only thing that they gambled for, they didn't uh, tear up, was his robe. That blood-stained robe. You know how, um, how the twelve brothers of Joseph, how did they cover their crime of selling Joseph? They killed a kid and they took Joseph's robe and they sprinkled the blood of the goat on the robe and they presented this blood-stained robe to the Father to cover their sin. What covers our sin? It's a blood-stained robe of Jesus. Except that robe of righteousness. We receive his righteousness. 
Say amen. It says, and to her was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. He's coming for a, a bride without spot or wrinkle or anything. He's offering us that. You don't want to be that person. The king comes in and says, friend, how did you come to the wedding without the garment? He's offering us that garment. He says, I counsel you embrace the righteousness that he's provided. And then he says there's an eye salve, an eye balm. We need our eyes open. So often we're blind leading the blind, measuring ourselves, by ourselves, among ourselves. Paul says we need to examine ourselves by the word. Are we in the faith? By Christ. A Christian is a follower, not of Christians. A Christian is not a follower of churches. A Christian is a follower of Christ. And we need to ask him through the Holy Spirit, like Paul and Ananias prayed for him, and these scales fell from his eyes, and he saw. Say, Lord, open our eyes. Ephesians 4.18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. God help us. Let's not have blind hearts in this age. We need the scales to fall. 2 Peter 1.9, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness as and forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. What does it mean? If you get comfortable with your old sins, Peter says you're blind. If we're being entertained by watching the things of the world, and we wouldn't commit those sins, but we enjoy watching other people commit them, so we do it vicariously. We need to pray, as it says in Isaiah 33, he that walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppression, he shakes his hands from holding bribes, he stops his ears from hearing of blood and shuts his eyes from seeing evil. We need to pray that God will forgive us for the stuff that we take in to our eyes and our ears. He's offering us that pure war wardrobe, that white raiment that he bought with his sacrifice. And he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten, be zealous therefore and repent. We're repenting of sin. This is what the church of Laodicea is being called to do. They are his church. Did Jesus have a church in the days when he came into the world, Israel? Were they lost? And most of them weren't looking for him. The apostles, were they arguing among themselves which was greatest? Were they often unconverted? Yeah. So it's possible to be in church and not in a saved condition. I don't want to be one of those that says, Lord, Lord, and have Jesus say, I don't know you. So what's the answer? We need to be zealous and repent. Jesus then, he says, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him. I'll dine with him and he with me. Think of that. It starts out by saying, the wrong thing in my mouth, I'm going to spit it out. What I want, though, is I want to sit down in the kingdom and eat with you. I want to take it in. I want to dine with you. I want to have this intimate relationship, this fellowship with you. We've got to open the door. See, we can't. You can't get the darkness out unless you have the light in. The best way to get the darkness out is bring the light in. Jesus is not only the light of the world, he is the door. He says, I am the door. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He wouldn't tell us all this unless it was possible for us to be saved. You know, I, you may have noticed in your bulletin something a little different. Instead of um, having a hymn, I said, we're going to sing a verse. And I don't know if any of you ever heard the song. It came out about 40 years ago. It maybe was not one of the most popular, but I learned it and I loved it, never forgot it. And it is basically a song that is based upon Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Now, did any of you ever hear that? I think Maranatha recorded it. 40 years ago. I thought I might be the only one here. So, the singers know this song. We're going to teach it to you. You can stay seated. 
We're going to sing it through once, maybe twice. It's a one short verse. Then we're going to have everybody stand at the end. We're going to all sing it together. And the words are on the Bible, on the screen, and they're in your Bible. It's Revelation 3.20. So just listen as we first sing this through. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any Bible. Why did you turn off my mic when I was singing? It says in the Bible, try to teach him a song. Sing a new song to the Lord, right? So for some of you, this may be a new song, but you should know the words. It's in your Bible. So we're going to sing it through again. If you think you're comfortable, you can sing along with us. And then the last time we'll all stand together, we'll sing. It's very simple. You sing the verse once, you repeat the last two words again at the end. Let's try it. sticks in your head through the day. hoping that is your prayer. He's standing at the door, door of your heart. He wants to come in. The Bible talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. He doesn't want to be on the outside. He wants to be in the inside. He wants you to know him. He wants to know you. But there's something you need to do to be saved. You need to open the door and surrender your life to him and his word and say, we're going to live for Christ. Now, I'm not doing a general altar call today because I'm hoping that if we're Laodicea, we're all part of it. But how many of you would like to say, Lord, open my eyes, open my ears, help me to see myself through your eyes and that we might repent and be zealous, be hot and on fire. Is that your prayer? Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that we'll take these things, this message, this love letter of Jesus to heart that will be serious about being real Christians, following not the standards of the world or even what may be acceptable in the church, but the standards of our Savior. Lord, I pray that you'll bless each one, help us to experience a genuine total conversion, a filling of the Spirit, that we can be your witnesses. I pray, Lord, that while we're now on our knees cool in repentance, that you can then boil us to zeal that we might be hot for our Savior. We thank you and pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good Sabbath. And for any visiting, we remind you, we do receive our tithes and offerings at the door. There'll be ushers there. Thank you.
Hi friends, the program you just watched was recorded at the Granite Bay Hilltop Church where I serve as lead pastor. We'd love to meet you. If you're ever in the Sacramento area, come and worship the Lord with us. We'll meet you